We are here with Ana Santomauro, who is the program curator at Ars Catalyst. They have the headquarters at King's Cross in London. And we were very much interested in having Hannah as part of our programs because we think that the works that our Catalyst is doing in, the, um, in supporting the production of art from a, a socially and also politically committed perspective is extremely important. And also, um, as you may know, this year's edition of the festival, so what, what is happening throughout the city, is dedicated to outer space and for many, many years one of the main focus of Arts Catalyst was also that on art and science, yeah. art and technologies. Oh my god. This is very loud. Um, so that was another reason why we thought that it was so important to have you here. So the floor is yours for the presentation. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks a lot, Carolina, for inviting me. And uh, thank you to, to Loop for uh, making this context possible. Um, I guess there's two things that might be slightly disappointed for you. <laughs> One is that um, so most of the, of the works and the projects that I'm going to talk about today uh, are materialized in uh, uh, films and videos, but I won't be necessarily showing them. So today what I want to do is to focus instead a bit more on the processes and the curatorial methodology. Uh, and most of the work that we do is available online, so you're more than welcome to go and explore a bit more. And then the second point of disappointment uh, might be that uh, I won't be specifically speaking about space, even though I'll be touching upon some of the of the projects uh, that have engaged with it. Uh, but generally, Arts Catalyst has got a, a history of 25 years. Uh, and these 25 years have been inhabited by many different people and many different curators. So I felt like I would not be able to give justice to Rob Lafrenet, who has curated for 17 years um, the programs at Arts Catalyst, in particular with an interest in outer space and, and the moon. So I, I decided to look into something else and look into more uh, recent work that, that we are doing. So generally, the, the talk will be structured with the first part, uh, which is more dedicated to uh, a bit of history of Arts Catalyst, a bit of context about it. Um, I will give you a couple of um, theoretical references and gen generally just to have more of a conceptual framework of what we are doing. And then the second part of the talk will be instead more focused on uh, current and more recent projects. And that <coughs> connects very much to us um, for the, for the first time having a space, uh, uh, a project space of our, o our own uh, since 2016 in King's Cross. But we'll get there. So Arts Catalyst was uh, founded in 1994 by Nicola Triscott. And Nicola Triscott has accompanied the organization for around 23 years. Uh, and just recently in April, really, uh, she, uh, she left and she became the CEO at, at FACT. But a lot of the work that I will be talking about is very much connected to her practice and partially also to her research. And um, over these 25 years, Arts Catalyst has commissioned um, art projects uh, and inquiries that critically engage with various matters of concern uh, in, a, in a transdisciplinary way and through a transdisciplinary perspective. Uh, we are mostly known for our work, as Carolina was saying before, um, at the intersection of art, science, and technology. And generally, the way we see the combination of these three fields of action and th these three fields of knowledge is as possible lenses and possible tools in order to engage with societal and political environmental uh, issues. So I guess two words that will come up quite often during the talk today uh, is this idea of the transdisciplinary and this idea of the situatedness. So I might just start by speculating a little bit and giving you a couple of references uh, of a possible genealogy of, transdip of transdisciplinarity. But just for you to bear in mind, this is not the only possible way to, to talk about it. Um, Something that I found quite interesting is that in 1994, um, the uh, physicist, the theoretical physici physicist, Basarab uh, Nicolescu, 
uh, set up the first uh, World Congress of Transdisciplinarity, uh, which included himself and uh, a series of uh, other academics coming from different fields. And um, as, as a result of, uh, of this conference, um, a, a sort of charter of transdisciplinarity was, was formulated. And I'm going to read for you just a couple of articles because it might resonate with some of the things that we will be talking about later on. Um, the article one says, any attempt to reduce the human being by formally defining what a human being is and subjecting the human being to reductive analysis within a framework of formal structures, no matter what they are, is incompatible with the transdisciplinary vision. Um, I'm quoting Article 2. The recognition of the existence of different levels of reality governed by different types of logic is inherent in, tr in transdisciplinary attitude. Any attempt to reduce reality to a single level governed by a single form of logic does not lie within the scope of transdisciplinarity. I will skip to Article 5, and then that, that's it with reading articles. The transdisciplinary vision is resolutely open insofar at it, as it goes beyond the field of the exact sciences and demands and demands the dialogue and the reconciliation within humanities and the social sciences, as well as with art, li uh, literature, poetry, and spiritual experiences. So it's quite interesting to see how this desire and this drive towards uh, a reconciliation between disciplines and an, and an attempt to go beyond the boundaries of each of these disciplines in, in the 90s, in the early 90s, was very much coming from the field of science. Uh, and physics in particular. And it's quite interesting, I won't be talking about it uh, today, but um, it's quite interesting uh, that uh, at the moment we are working um, as a part of uh, a, an art in physics. Sorry, I'm going to take this one off, otherwise you'll keep hearing my... That's better. <laughs> <laughs> That's much better. Um, yeah. I feel I very looked what after. What <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> That's fine. I wish I could continue speaking, but it's very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> Great, wonderful. So yeah, I was just mentioning that one of the programs that we are currently working on, and it, this is something that Nicola Triscott very much curated uh, as an art and physics network. And we are working with uh, a bunch of physicists who do meditation, who do um, fasting, uh, who uh, experience different ways of accessi accessing um, knowledge and producing knowledge. Uh, which is very, very much, yeah, it's just very fascinating. Um, so that's, that's an interesting reso resonance there. Uh, another reference in terms of transdisciplinarity, which I thought might be quite interesting to, to just quote very briefly, uh, it's the expression used by a British artist, uh, John Latham, um, of the incidental person. So the incidental person being the individual or, or the person who engages with non-art contexts in order to activate different forms of engagement that are not necessarily functional within the art context and they're not even functional within the different fields uh, in which the artist is operating. So I don't know how familiar you are with the work of John Latham, uh, but he was one of the founders with Barbara Stevini, even though she's always forgotten, um, of the artist placement group. Uh, and one of the mottos is context is half work. So the way the, the artist placement group used to work is artists well sent to different industries and councils and different institutions to work in a very embedded way in these institutions and within these industries without necessarily the idea of coming up with a final result or an artistic output, but instead with the idea of trying to um, sort of push the boundary of these different contexts where they were operating. But that's a whole different conversation. 
And finally, um, I guess another important ref reference for me when we talk about the transdisciplinarity is this idea of the extradisciplinary, uh, which is very much um, coming from uh, artist and art theorist uh, Brian Orms. Uh, who defines uh, the extradisciplinarity as uh, a sort of neutral common terrain where different disciplines can meet and inform each other, uh, at, while at the same time pretty much forgetting what they really are. So I'm just quoting very briefly uh, one of his essays, uh, and he says, uh, the extradisciplinary ambition is to carry out rigorous investigations on terrains as far from art as finance, biotech, geography, urbanism, psychiatrist, the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum, and so on. To bring those terrain, in those terrains the, the free play of the faculties and the intersubjective experimentation that are characteristics of modern art. So it's quite interesting, again, to see how Brian Orms speculates on this idea of operating outside and outside each of the disciplines. So in a way, this doesn't necessarily mean uh, that we need to get rid of all disciplines uh, and the knowledge that is produced within physics, within geography, art, and so on and so on. Uh, but we should, um, in a way, aim at what Isabel Stengels called an ecology of practices. Um, and the, the idea of the ecology of practices is this idea of a process uh, of social transformation, uh, where the progress that is attached to each particular uh, discipline is not uh, related to a particular discipline finding the truth, but it is uh, defined by a sort of social technology of, uh, of belonging. Um, so, uh, again, this idea of being situated within, within a discipline and uh, uh, exploring the, the boundaries uh, of, uh, of, the of the disciplines and exploring the transformational dimension um, of, uh, of physics and uh, each of the possible disciplines we are working um, with and, and within. Um, so Isabel Stengels says that one of the ways we can work ethically and responsibly, say as a physicist, is not actually um, with the aim of finding a truth, but it's with the aim of opening imagination um, to all the possible uh, to all the possibilities and at the maximum possible levels. So in a way, as Guattari would say, to, to open to to find ways of working tran um, transversally. So the, the, the practitioners in this way never close the doors to a transformative uh, intention um, because, because they, they need to be related to a particular disciplinary boundary. Um, and uh, Isabel Stengels, in, in her work around the ecology of practices, also speaks about uh, this idea of thinking par, par le milieu, so thinking from the middle but also thinking from the, the, uh, the sort of context and from the habitat uh, in which they, they operate. Um, I guess the idea of the, situa no the situated knowledge and the situatedness will come up later through some of the projects. I feel like I've been like, splurging enough uh, quotes and references to you for now. So it might be interesting to look instead into uh, more specific projects that we, we have been working uh, on. So I thought uh, this would be a nice one to start with, um, because in a way it very much um, defined the pattern of Arts Catalyst over uh, almost uh, two decades. Okay, this might be slightly better. Gosh, yes. Um, so, yeah, before going into the Zero Gravity project, uh, it might be interesting to think about what happened in the 90s and what happened in those years when Arts Catalyst was being set up. So the 90s were the time when uh, the Human Genome Project was started. Uh, it was the decade where the World Wide Web 
uh, was pretty much becoming part of people's lives. Uh, and it's also the decade where the first human being born from an in vitro fertilization uh, by mechanically injecting a single selected sperm into a cell egg uh, happened. So all these different, thi this is very much uh, a context in which Arts Catalyst was, was initiated. And I guess one of, the f one of the key intentions was to understand what was happening in science and how to critically engage with all these different uh, inputs coming from uh, different, different fields of science and how to critically engage with, uh, with all of them. And I guess I chose to, uh, to talk about the Zero Gravity Project because it's also one of the most spectacular ones. And it's the one where uh, Arts Catalyst very much started to become um, part of this uh, international art and science uh, network, which actually got to become um, embedded in the, in the context of the UK uh, and the art world in the UK quite later on. It has always been considered quite marginal um, <coughs> Um, so, in between the 2000 and 2004, um, we invited uh, 16 artists uh, to experience uh, zero gravitation and the conditions of living at uh, zero gravity. Uh, well, there were 16 visual artists, but at the same time, uh, uh, they were put in dialogue and they were peered with uh, musicians, scientists and philosophers who were all together invited to access weightlessness and uh, zero gravity uh, conditions. Uh, at the Gagarin Cosmonaut Training uh, Center in Star, Star City in, uh, in Russia, uh, which is a very secluded, secluded space. So even just the fact of uh, accessing that, that space was quite, quite important and quite, quite groundbreaking. Um, so the, the uh, pairing of artists with scientists uh, manifested itself in a series of flying laboratories. Uh, and one of them uh, was led by um, artist and dancer uh, Kitsu Dubois, uh, who worked with the biodynamics research group at the Imperial College uh, of, of London. And through the laboratory in, in Star City, she explored um, experimental movement and performance uh, in an environment uh, where uh, altered um, gravity conditions are, are produced. So in a way, she intervened, she intervened in the field of art and science uh, by uh, understanding the possibilities of the human body within different kinds of environment, and in particular within uh, weightlessness. Uh, and this uh, choreography uh, called the uh, um, trajectoire fluid uh, is, is one of the outcomes of, uh, of the project. Uh, another project that emerged from um, uh, the experience at uh, Star City and as part of the Zero Gravity program uh, is by uh, Jem Feiner and Ansman Biswas, who um, explored uh, different um, flying experiences with carpets that were very, it, it was a very playful. Uh, performative uh, and spectacular exercise where they were just flying on carpets. <laughs> and <laughs> this is what artists do when you give them a weightless experience. Like they want a carpet and then they want to fly. Um, and the idea was to uh, question and to put into crisis, uh, in a way, through this playful experience, uh, the myths and aesthetics connected to uh, science. Uh, within the zero gravity context. And uh, another project that uh, came out of this experience uh, is Autolit One, which is the first ever commissioned uh, work, artwork uh, by the Autolith, uh, the Autolith group. Um, so Kojo, Eshwan, and uh, Angelica Sagal. Um, and it's a quite interesting film essay uh, where they tried uh, in a way to question the male, the white male lineage 
of uh, scientists and astronauts. And it tells the story of uh, an anthropologist, uh, a female anthropologist, who uh, lives in a world in the 22nd century, where um, weightlessness is just the normal way of being, and no one knows how to go back to Earth or to the normal Earth conditions. And in the film essay, uh, this um, narrator voice, the anthropologist, uh, tells the story of um, uh, we female scientists uh, meeting a uh, uh, hundred years before, um, and uh, it pretty much depicts a scenario where uh, science is completely different from how the, the, the perception and the imaginary connected to science is completely different from the one that we uh, have uh, today. But uh, instead, it, it encounters different fields uh, of, um, of political and social action. So in, in a way, um, uh, there's a number of different female characters, like the president of the National Federation of Indian Women, uh, who are, are part of the of the film essay. And um, well, at, at the end of uh, of the day, what the essay the essay uh, the film essay does is to um, to imagine a, a different possible uh, scenario for for science and for the role of, of women uh, in in science and uh, for the role of uh, minorities in in science so again this idea of the cohabitation of artists and scientists together comes up in another project uh, in 2002 called macro lab uh, which consisted in a temporary living laboratory, a temporary, a temporary living structure that was uh, constructed uh, and uh, installed in the, um, in, the high, in the Scottish Highlands, uh, where artists and scientists were invited to live together over three months. And uh, they were invited to think together about different forms of open source, telecommunication, uh, weather prediction, um, and uh, um, environmental issues and different forms of open source monitoring, and the project was initiated by uh, uh, Marco Pel the Slovenian artist Marco Pelian. Again, I will just go very quickly on these projects. There's plenty of documentation and plenty of information on our website, so if you're interested in particularly uh, knowing what emerged out of each of them, please uh, feel free to, to ask for more details later. But in a way, I in, in, in my genealogy and in my uh, journey within Arts Catalyst, uh, I always feel like the first decade also of the project, uh, of, of the organization, was very much uh, dedicated to a quite traditional way of understanding uh, how artists and scientists could, could work together uh, towards a common output that was the artwork that most of the times had a quite spectacular presence um, uh, in, in the public space or within gallery spaces. Uh, and I, I, I believe that this project, the Arctic, Arctic Perspective Initiative, uh, very much marked a shift in, in our way of working, which became much more embedded and well, um, the artists and the scientists were now also uh, in dialogue with uh, communities and with communities of interest outside of the specific expertise and the, the specific um, uh, fields of knowledge that the scientists could, could bring about. So in 2009, um, uh, again, artist Marco uh, Palian and Matthew Biederman uh, initiated uh, the, the project, which still continues as a sort of um, autonomous para-institution uh, per se. Uh, so the generally the project happened in collaboration with uh, people of uh, Iglulik and other communities uh, in uh, Nunavut in uh, Canada. And um, the artists invited uh, scientists and, uh, and architects to devise uh, a mobile media and living unit infrastructure that was powered by renewable energy sources and that, again, could be used for nomadic dwelling, um, for environmental monitoring, and for uh, different forms of media-based 
uh, devices and works that were uh, very much supported by the philosophy and the idea of the open source. And that was a particularly interesting one because, uh, because of the tension existing in the, in the polar region um, that now we are pretty much all aware of because of the, of the climate change and environmental change and the whole conversation around, uh, around ice melting. Uh, but it feels like there is always something which is not part of the conversation, or someone who is not part of the conversation, and it's the, the indigenous uh, people and indigenous communities, which instead in this project were very much, uh, very much key, and they co-devised uh, these um, dwelling structures together with the artists and the architects and the scientists, really according to uh, what the needs um, and what the main matters of concern uh, were. So this is one of, so there was a sort of open competition, an open call for uh, artists and designers to, uh, to submit an idea for um, a, a dwelling structure, and this is one, one of them. But generally, the project highlighted uh, the tension existing in, uh, in the Arctic and in the polar region, and, um, and and the, f the strong discomfort that the local communities uh, and indigenous communities felt towards uh, the way the territory uh, was being treated as either a site for uh, extraction of resources um, or as a site of study and, and exploration. So in a way, what we try to do is to come out of uh, the sort of consultation dynamic and instead open up a much more fluid and participatory way of working. <coughs> Are there any questions so far? Are you happy for me to move on to other projects? Yeah. Okay. So I thought uh, it might be worth talking about uh, one of the most recent projects, uh, which is called the Wrecked on the Intertidal Zone, uh, which um, was um, initiated by Arts Catalyst in collaboration with uh, uh, artist collective, artist duo Yoha, uh, uh, Critical Art Ensemble, um, Fran Gallardo and Andy Freeman. And it's an exploration in the geopolitical uh, and eco-political issues of the, of the Thames, and in particular the Thames estuary. Uh, around uh, towns called the Leon Sea and South End uh, in, in UK. I'm not sure how familiar you are with them. They're very small um, towns, but actually very uh, dense in terms of the, of the tensions and the transformations that they are undergoing. Um, and I guess when we started the project, one of the very key things that we felt is that you can't really reduce the, the Thames reduce the Thames to uh, any quantifiable uh, approach or purely scientific approach, because in itself it contains uh, an incredible biodiversity, but also a number of different ways of, uh, of being, fishing, um, uh, living with, with the context and, and living with the ecology from, from the local people, uh, that in a way the pure scientific methods could not uh, completely grasp. And in particular, the estuary is changing very rapidly because it is now becoming, it has become one of the largest uh, container port uh, in, in UK, I think, uh, in, in Europe. So there's this process of acceleration and, and transformation which is affecting, of course, the ecology of, um, of, the, of the estuary uh, but, and also the ways of living with, with it and the way the, the communities live, live with it. Um, so the, the estuary is generally uh, characterized by its uh, sea marshes, uh, the uh, mu very, mu very, very muddy waters. Uh, if you decide to go uh, on a walk there, just make sure that you've got some training on how to walk with mud, because it's not easy, and you fall and you get stuck. Uh, and it's, as I was saying, very much um, characterized by uh, a sense of wilderness um, and a very rich biodiversity. Uh, and the communities who live uh, there, in 
they're very much uh, attached to, uh, to the mud in itself. So for a very long time, they would go foraging, uh, so taking, um, harvesting herbs and using them also for food, as food and uh, for uh, consumption. Uh, there's a very strong uh, fishing community, a uh, very strong bird watching community, and there's just like a sense of uh, belonging, of, of being there, uh, of knowing exactly every single aspect of this ecology from the local community that even uh, a very expert uh, scientist can, cannot completely cover it because of this in yeah, invisible um, micropolitics that exist in, in the area. Uh, so, uh, the, the, the different artists that we involved ended up working very closely together, uh, even though there were a number of different outputs and outcomes coming out of the, uh, of the project, which actually lasted three years. Um, and there's one of the artworks that is still uh, there and that you can still visit. Um, and over three years, we uh, organized a number of citizen science activities, uh, with the local community, uh, with uh, we uh, we invited uh, artists to go foraging with uh, again the fishermen and and the local communities, um, and as part of of the project, uh, the the key most monumental output uh, that came out of it is this sort of anti monument called Graveyard of Lost Species by Yoha and Critical Art Ensemble. So over these two to three years, the artists have been, uh, actually one of the artists also lives there, which is an important uh, thing uh, to, to think about. Um, so they have been in dialogue with, uh, with the members of the local communities, asking them what they feel is being lost and what are the lost species uh, in South End and Leon Sea and generally in the wider um, uh, Thames ecology. And uh, at the end of this process, they uh, worked with um, a local uh, engraver. Do you say that? Yes. Uh, in order to, um, to mark all these different worlds and to engrave all these different worlds uh, on, um, on a ship, on a wreck that was recovered and reclaimed from the mud. So it was a quite laborious operation. And the wreck of this boat that has, has been there for around 100 years um, and now it's been reclaimed, um, is, is still in the mud, so every, yeah, it's, it's quite interesting to go and visit it because sometimes the mud pushes it further away, sometimes you, you find it closer. Um, I would recommend not to climb on it. Um, and as part of the project, we uh, also worked with a Spanish artist based in London uh, called Fran Gallardo. Uh, who ran a series of uh, cit citizen science workshop um, looking into local foods and uh, their souls. Uh, so it would go foraging with the local fishermen and learn about all sorts of recipes um, uh, that could be produced out of, uh, of, of these uh, very local uh, products. Um, and uh, the, the book, a recipe book, a recipe book came out of it, and it's, to it's called uh, Talking Dirty. Tongue first, there's uh, quite a few interesting recipes. Some of them contain hair, soy, and other things that I wouldn't recommend necessarily reproducing at home without a scientist around <laughs> being able to test it. But we tested everything, and at the end of this process, we had uh, a communal meal with um, with local people, and yeah, no one got hurt, fortunately. So yeah, as I was saying, in uh, 2016, uh, after 20 something years just working as a, a nomadic um, curatorial agency, uh, we started our own space. We really felt the need of having our own space, and uh, so we um, we started a project space, uh, our own center in King's Cross, um, where uh, we have exhibitions, but uh, we also have a number of different pub public programs that accompany the exhibition. The space is very, very small, and it has this great quality of being extremely porous because it has 
three of these big windows going all around. So it feels like very much like being in the public space. Uh, and also it's a very particular area of King's Cross. I don't know how familiar you are with uh, King's Cross in general, but there's an area uh, which is being regenerated uh, and gentrified uh, where Centra Central St. Martins is. Um, and, and, and it's just on one side of, of the station. On the other side of the King's Cross station, it feel everyone says that it feels like London 20 years ago. Um, so it still feels like a very um, residential, very multicultural, uh, very independent uh, area, which is, which is very uh, great. Um, we opened the center with uh, an exhibition called the Notes from the Field um, that brought together diff a selection of different uh, case studies and artworks um, as part of the Arte Util uh, archive. Uh, Arte Util is a project initiated by Tania Broghera. I'm sure you are all famili familiar with it. I won't go into that many details about it. Uh, but generally the project has got um, a very wide archive, uh, including social engaged uh, art projects and initiatives that have um, a strong impact in the social, uh, in the environmental and in the, the political scenario of um, the different kind of contexts and in different parts of the world. And so we selected a number of, um, of different projects that particularly, de particularly dealt with environmental and ecological uh, issues, which seems to be one of the recurring themes for Arts Catalyst. Um, and then the last project I wanted to mention, and I wanted to delve into a bit more, but I now realize that I've spoken for too long, uh, is called the Test Sites, uh, and uh, it, it was initiated in 2017, uh, and it's a series of inquiries into matters of concern connected to environmental change into different parts of the UK, uh, and one of them uh, is the Calder Valley and its wider catchment in West Yorkshire. Um, so I guess there's a, a real shift in our way of working from very international and transnational projects uh, from Star City to the polar region uh, to now working wi within the, the boundaries of, of the UK. And that's a very interesting uh, step that happened uh, while the referendum for Brexit was becoming more real. Uh, and when uh, a number of different conversations around the future of the country uh, emerged. So we felt like there was a real need for us to get out of London and get to understand a bit more what the key concerns are, especially in relation to environmental questions in different parts of the country. Uh, so West Yorkshire is um, an area that has been affect affected by floods over 200 years. Um, and there was a flood quite recently, it was really bad. Uh, there was a major one in 2016 um, in, on Boxing Day, uh, and that was like a wake-up call for, for everyone. So the, all the conversations around climate change and environmental change all of a sudden became uh, much more real and tangible. Uh, so what we did is we initiated uh, a series of what we call co-inquiries or collective inquiries, uh, which is a curatorial methodology um, or a toolbox more than a uh, methodology where we bring together artists, scientists, and members of the communities without necessarily thinking about going towards a common output, uh, but with the idea of each of, the, of these different parties involved in the project can operate quite autonomously. And then there's moments in which these different inquiries cross over with each other. Other times they just take different, um, different kind of routes and, and paths. Uh, and in this case, we are working with uh, an artist called Ruth Levine uh, and uh, a, an anthropologist called uh, Megan Clinch. Uh, and it's quite interesting because uh, in a way, uh, after the first year of research and um, and conversations with different stakeholders in the area. Uh, the, the medical anthropologist very much took the lead of part of the project, 
uh, and it, she almost became like a sort of researcher, embedded researcher in, in the organization. So also the, the, the different dynamics between artists and scientists uh, change quite, uh, quite a lot according to the different projects. So this is a map of the, of the catchment. I won't go too much into details, but uh, one of the key elements that inspired us is this idea of the planetary, uh, of the planetary health that was uh, formulated by the Lancet Commission, um, uh, initiated by the Rockefeller Foundation. So what the, the notion of planetary health um, entails is the fact that human health cannot exist on its own. There's an interconnectedness that needs to be taken into account between different systems. So we can't really talk about environmental change only by thinking about consuming less plastics uh, as, as humans, but it's in a way we need to make an effort uh, to think be beyond uh, the, yeah, our human perspective. So we started the, uh, the project with a series of um, research residencies where we, I, I was in the job, I had been in the job for two weeks and Nicola Trisco told me, can you, um, how do you say, can you steer a boat? And I was like, no, <laughs> not really, you will learn. And I thought, oh, this is an interesting job. <laughs> and yeah, my work at Alts Catalyst will be quite fascinating. And so I was literally thrown on a boat by my former director and learned how to steer a boat uh, with uh, the artist, Ruth Levine. But what we did was uh, traveling uh, up and down the, um, the canal system um, in, uh, in West Yorkshire. And w at every stop, we would have conversations with people at the pub, people that we invited uh, to have a cup of tea with us on, on the boat, engineers, uh, people who work in the, in the water, um, system and water management and who uh, deal with water man uh, maintenance in, in the area. Um, and it was a quite highlighting um, experience uh, because in a way what we realized is that when we talk about planetary health, of course we need to take into account the, no the, the living non-human, uh, but we also need to think about uh, the non-living non-human, which means the infrastructure. So there's a very interesting quote from uh, uh, Susan Leistar, um, who was a social scientist, and she says that the infrastructure becomes visible when it starts to fall apart. And this is what we are experiencing in UK. So the infrastructure is starting to fall apart and you all, all of a sudden you do realize that there is an infrastructure that takes water into your, into your tap. So I guess the, this initial question around flooding and how can we collectively rethink ways of engaging with an area that uh, is affected by flooding shifted quite dramatically. And mainly thanks to the work that we've been doing with uh, the medical anthropologist, Megan Clinch. Um, and we've sort of reformulated the key questions uh, of the project uh, as simply as who owns the water, who looks after the water, um, and who cares for, for it. And with these three very key basic questions, there's a whole can of worms that opens up. Because you start to ask people who owns water, and they would go, well, it was British water until 2012 when it was privatized, and now the canal and river um, waterways are uh, managed by Canal and River Trust, which is a quite small charity that is supposed to do the maintenance of river and canals in an area that is affected by floods, uh, which is quite, quite interesting. And then another uh, immediate answer is, well, of course, Yorkshire water owns the water. But then you start digging and digging, and you realize that uh, Yorkshire water, um, which deals primarily with domestic water, uh, has uh, offshore all owns offshore companies in the Cayman Island. And so this system, which looks uh, at the very first gaze, very solid and almost monolithic. We know who takes care of our water, we know where our water comes from, starts to, yeah, as Lu Susan, uh, Susan, Susan Leistal says, it starts to fall apart and to show its cracks. Um, 
and uh, at the end of the day, what the, the conversation that needs to be had when we talk about environmental change, especially in a country like the UK, is around austerity and what austerity has produced to our institutional system and to uh, those different structures that are supposed to govern the, the everyday uh, use of water and the, the, the everyday management of water. And the interesting thing is that um, people in the area are more and more encouraged by uh, these different institutions to volunteer. Uh, so there's this thing which is becoming very popular in UK called the green prescription. So if you suffer from any distress, go out there and have an, an allotment, do some volunteering, do some volunteering with Canal and River Trust, become a flood wardians. All of a sudden, you are in charge <laughs> of, the, uh, of the flood defenses, but you don't really have the, the means and the tools to do that. So I know this might sound like quite intricate and very, very specific to the UK context, but I think it's something quite widespread and uh, that speaks to many different countries and many different systems that uh, are not really working and that make use of uh, care, work uh, and um, affective qualities of people going volunteering and taking in charge things that should be instead managed uh, in different ways. So as part of the, of the process of the inquiry, uh, we developed a, a number of different tricks in order to um, initiate conversations with the locality. So uh, Ruth Levine, the artist, uh, she has made um, a geologic strata cake. Um, yeah, that was like a big commitment. That w and we were traveling around this region with this cake and you know, it's quite interesting to see how cake sparks conversation around water governance. <laughs> it's, it was quite effective. So again, thinking about what, uh, uh, like the, the, the interesting reference from Isabel Stengels, uh, she speaks about um, the cold panic situation we are all in. And she says, I'm quoting, our guardians are responsible for the management of what one might call a cold panic. A panic that is signaled by the fact that openly contradictory messages are accepted. Keep consuming. Economic growth depends on it. But think about your carbon footprint. You have to realize that your lifestyles will have to change, but don't forget that we are engaged in a competition on which our prosperity depends. Our governments are totally incapable of dealing with the situation. Economic warfare obliges them to stick to the goal of irresponsible, even criminal, economic growth, whatever the cost. So that was Isabel Stengels. And as part of this process of traveling up and down uh, the, the valley and the catchment, the artist has also produced a number of miniatures uh, that very much manifest uh, the conversations and the concerns that people have um, expressed um, in relation to the valley and to the water uh, situation in the valley. Um, so each of the, of the miniatures uh, in relation to each other produce a particular scenario that uh, through a number of different activities and workshop we ask participants to, to change or rethink. So for instance, what happens if the farmers in the uplands stop um, burning uh, parts of the um, parts of the land uh, in order to allow for hunting and grouse shooting. Grouse is a particular kind of, of birds and there's this sort of sport and hobby in UK where uh, people just go and, and shoot them. And this, this is very dangerous because uh, it, it changes completely the quality of the soil and once the quality of the soil uh, is that dramatically changed, the also its ability of absorbing water um, is uh, diminished. And, and that plays within the whole flooding uh, cycle. And finally, as accompanying uh, these hyper-localized conversations, in our center we try and keep uh, our perspective quite wide open to more international um, 
projects and different international uh, case studies uh, that we bring in the space, uh, even though we don't commission necessarily them uh, to spark a conversation uh, around envir environmental change in this case and different forms of governance and how we can play autonomy uh, within those. So I really like this quote from Rosie Braidotti and she says, you know, th th everyone just says, oh, we are in this together when it comes to climate change. But yet, yeah, we are not one and the same. There's people and communities and areas that uh, will suffer for climate change more than, than others. And this is something that needs to be acknowledged. Uh, so this is a, uh, an exhibition that uh, we curated this summer. Uh, and it very much is attached to the test sites project. So it raises the same kind of questions. How can we uh, govern? How can we steward? How can we... Uh, common uh, our natural resources and how can we rethink our relationship to infrastructure um, in a more in a more empowerful uh, way um, and yeah the, the 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 world planetary resonates a lot with the work of uh, Jennifer Gabriel's uh, there's a very interesting text on on efflux e written by her um, called towards the planetary no, it's um, becoming planetary. And she makes very clear the difference between what is planetary and what is global. So in a way, the notion of planetary goes beyond the uh, abstraction uh, of, of globality. And I'm just quoting her. The planetary is the difference, distance, and duration with, within, and against which it might be possible to think differently about human and becoming collective. The planet might even overwrite the globe to undo the assumed uniformity of global systems and exchanges. So as part of Towards the Planetary Commons, we uh, presented a work by Marwa Arsanius um, called, well, two works, um, um, Who is Afraid of Ideology, Part 1 and Part uh, 2. Uh, so in particular, in Part 2, uh, she... Um, She's been working over two years uh, with um, a group of women in the village, of Kurdish women in the village of uh, Jinwal um, in, uh, in northern Syria, uh, where um, the community has very much reinvented ways of uh, dealing with, uh, with the land, with the soil, uh, based on uh, different commoning, commoning uh, activities. Um, we presented the work of Paloma Polo called uh, The Earls of the Revolution. Uh, it's a new work. Uh, it's, I think, now until the end of January at uh, Cados de Mayo in Madrid. So if you have the chance, go and, um, and see it. Uh, and it's part of uh, ongoing research into the Philippines and the different communist struggles against uh, land grabbing in, uh, in the area. So in a way, we brought together these different works to initiate conversations around how can we rethink infrastructures of autonomy uh, and how can we look uh, at different ways of engaging with it um, coming from uh, context of, of conflict. As part of the exhibition, we also had uh, a sort of living room that uh, has been designed by the artist uh, Lorenzo Sandoval and that included a number of different resources. So it was very much of an invitation uh, for uh, the members of the audience to spend time in the exhibition space and to, and to read and to go through uh, some of the key inspirations. And we are currently developing a new strand of program called Extractable Matters uh, that looks at the politics of mining um, and the politics of extraction on a global scale. We've got an exhibition by uh, Ignacio Acosta uh, that looks at extraction of copper uh, and a number of other minerals between Chile um, and northern uh, Sweden. And in particular, the exhibition is looking at how um, indigenous communities and activist communities are making use of technologies like drones uh, in order to counter the uh, vi the extractive violence of uh, mining companies. And I thought I will just leave it here with this quote from uh, Catherine Yusuf, which I think it's very, it's very powerful. Um, and yeah, maybe this is a good time for questions. Gosh, I spoke way too much. Are there any questions? Let me go to the last slide. Any questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, 
Hector Domring from Amsterdam. Mm -hmm. Well, I have a, a simple uh, question, uh, whether art is a mean or an end in the project. <laughs> I think art is part of a um, composition where well, there's uh, a long genealogy of the world of, of the world composition, and Bruno Latour speaks about uh, working in com like in composition of different systems and systems of uh, of knowledge. But generally, for me, for us, I think um, the artist um, more and more through the projects that we have been developing within the last uh, decade or so is part of a much broader conversation. And this is why we've started using the idea of the collective inquiry. Uh, and we've started thinking about this relationship between art and science, not as something that needs to be merged and needs to look towards a common goal, but as a sort of common terrain where um, each of the different fields of knowledge can carve out different mm. forms of autonomy, but still participate in a common conversation. Um, so I. I, I, what we try to do is to have, when we can, uh, an impact on uh, on the on the localities and on the context that we uh, we work with. So just to uh, I haven't really spoken about it because it's very much in process. But uh, one of the ideas for the next year uh, in the Calder Valley in West Yorkshire is to develop with some of the key stakeholders that we have been working with a people's water policy. So looking at how people who are volunteering, people who are um, self-organizing in order to think how to tackle issues of flooding, uh, for instance, using, using um, natural flooding defenses, uh, how can we bring all these existing practices together and systematize them in the form of a, of a policy that might have a performative dimension and will for sure have a performative dimension. But we are also working with members of the councils, for instance, and including them in these conversations and hoping that uh, there might be some, some yeah. change starting from um, the inputs uh, and the processes that we activate. It, it sounds as if art is a means within a political project in my view. Which I don't, sh and I don't know if it is a bad thing. What do you think? Well, I, don't say, I, I, don't, I didn't say it's, it's bad yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to have no, a political I'm project. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm interested not at all. to know what, what do you think? Do you think? Well, I think it's, it's more a political project than, mm. than an, an artistic project. <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with a no. political project. And it's nothing wrong using art in political, for political means, yeah. political ends. kind of interesting there's um, I mean you were talking about how Isabel Stegner said that finding a not about finding a truth but opening the imagination kind of mm -hmm. and the possibilities and I feel at the current time it, but it's actually always humans have a tendency and I think in this terms of a political project that we're quite attached to some truths at the moment so all a lot of art and different things are heading in these directions of these attached of these truths and not actually opening possibilities because there's this overlaying thing that it's the end of the world, you know, in some ways, basically. And the age of post-truth, so we need to. Yeah, but somehow I think that there's a big struggle because we still operate from this. And I'm also in the master's program of transdisciplinarity in Zurich. And I also notice with a lot of the younger students that they're so overwhelmed by this truth, it completely stops the openness to possibility. So I'm curious what you're doing with your organization. Um, it's something I'm also working on, is how do you keep these possibilities open and for a moment without that overlaying truth? Because I think it's important, as you said, to step outside of that um, to be able to look at, at new possibilities. So I'm curious how you're working with that. I think there's that. a real genuine desire in scientists, for instance, to expand and to look at reality beyond the academia and beyond the, the disciplinary uh, boundaries. Um, and this is why I mentioned particularly the work that we've been doing with Megan Clinch, the medical anthropologist, because beyond the idea of her research being quite instrumental in the project. There's also a question, a desire coming from her to finally see her work having an impact in, in society. So I think there's a, 
there's, a, yeah, as you say, there's, there's definitely uh, an attachment to, to truth. But on the other hand, I, I have encountered uh, a desire uh, in many practitioners and many scientists, experts from different fields, to actually sit together around the table and just understand what is going on and um, expand the reach of each of us, really. And this is why the, we are activating a number of different networks, like the Alton Physics Network, where at the end of the day, what we are discussing in the Alton Physics ne Network is the culture of physics and the politics of physics and how people who are in the, in the world of physic, physics are uh, demanding for, for a change. And so, yes, yeah, you say, art becomes a means, art, art becomes instrumental. Uh, also for people from different disciplines in order to go through a transformational process that they see art can bring about. And that's, I, I don't know, I think it's quite fascinating. I also have a question. Um, before you were saying that at the beginning the practices of arts catalysts were quite marginalized, um, and I'm curious in relation to what we've been talking about right now, so your uh, social and political commitment in a way, how your relationship to um, your peer institutions in London has changed throughout the years, um, if you do projects together, yeah. and to what extent they collaborate or not. Yeah, I think especially in the first uh, 10 to 15 years, art and science was not necessarily part of the art world. It was always something, I wouldn't, s maybe not marginal, but lateral to the art world. And it, had, it has had its own system and its own infrastructure for a very long time. Uh, but I think uh, more recently, part of our work has changed. So we've been working more and more in terms of social and political engagement. So also the boundaries of arts catalyst have soften, softened quite a lot. Um, and at the same time, um, arts organizations in UK, but I think this is something quite common and it doesn't necessarily have geographical boundaries, are looking with more interest at the role of technology and the role of, of science uh, in, in our society. Um, so we, we've been building more and more alliances and we work quite collaboratively with uh, a number of different organizations in London. So last year we did a, a residency with uh, the Autolith, Autolith Collective, which is Autolith Group, the artist duo, but they also have a sort of organization. Uh, and we have initiated this residency for um, young uh, artists and curators called the Undisciplinary in, in the form of a sort of uh, support network uh, where um, we would provide to them some mentoring opportunities. We've been working with Delfina Foundation this year, even just this year, I can, I can think of many different uh, collaborations. And we are now in the process of relocating uh, our headquarters from London to Sheffield. And so our desire to strengthen um, collaborations in London is even uh, more amplified. Are there any more questions? How do you choose the projects that you or the communities where you're working with it? And how do you avoid helicopter um, issues with that? Um, well, I guess in some of the projects I've been talking about, uh, we've been working, for instance, with artists who are quite local. So wrecked on the intertidal zone, the project on the Thames estuary. Uh, I think at least two of the artists that were involved um, lived there. And you know, the way we choose the context, it changes a lot. Sometimes, I, I think in that case, it was the artist who approached us and said, look, this is happening. Uh, the, 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 the estuary is changing. Uh, they, they knew that we had a strong interest in ecological and <coughs> eco-political issues. Um, so in that case, the conversation really started from the embeddedness of, of the artists. And they would go out and fish with the local people because they are local. Um, but that's not always the case. Also in test sites in West Yorkshire, the artist in base is based in Yorkshire. So there's a number of different things that we uh, take into consideration when we approach a new context. 
so making sure that the artist is not parachuted and then taken out of the way uh, after a year. It's something we are very, very keen on. And also we've got like these quite long projects. So test sites, it's in its third year and I don't see it finishing soon. Uh, so that, that idea of being there and constantly uh, showing up our faces, uh, initiating conversations, uh, running workshops, making a lot of activities that are supposed to be research and that could very well happen you know, behind the curtain public is also one of the strategies that we use quite often. Um, yeah, but the, I, I can't really think of a set of parameters that we use, those choices that we make all the time. And these choices try to sort of match the, what we think the urgencies of the context are. Um, I think because you work a lot with, it seems, with local councils and um, uh, non-for-profit organisations, has, or I guess, have you noticed or have you at least got feedback from within the communities the, the influence or the impact that it's had with the artistic involvement versus when they just run autonomously on their own? I've got a good, a good story here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, now I'm not just saying that <sighs> this is because of us. But recently, one of the uh, members of the of a local council we have been in dialogue with for a very long time, I, and he is a Tory. Well, he used to be a Tory, and uh, a few months ago, he uh, switched, he, he swapped to Green Party, and he said, you know, that the conversations that we've been having over two years, well, we were literally, literally just uh, calling the councillor and going, oh, have you heard this news? What do you think about it? You know, just like spending time and allowing time for those conversations to happen. And he mentioned that part of the choice to swap from Tory to Green Party <coughs> was also part of um, us, us being there, but not only. But um, yeah, I guess there's, there's a real desire, especially when you work in smaller contexts outside of London, for broader uh, forms of engagement. Uh, and I think, uh, in a way, local communities don't really care if you are an artist or not. They, they don't really pay attention necessarily to the fact that you are producing an artwork and that the quality of this artwork is good or, or bad. And this is not to infantilize them or to, to patronize them. It's just that allow, sometimes what art does is allow a space for a conversation that wouldn't happen otherwise. Um, and so we have noticed uh, different kinds of collaborations on a local scale, well, different groups that were doing work um, around natural flood management, for instance, uh, have been cooperating more than they used to, and just small, small things we can't really expect to have in our life changing uh, impact on them. But yeah, there's definitely small trick that we do recognize are coming from allowing and reinforcing that space for broader conversation and for encounters that wouldn't necessarily happen. So for instance, when in the test sites project, something that we are very keen on is have a catchment wide approach, like not necessarily looking at what happens in this town where the flood happened or what happens in that other town, but create an approach where different parts of the, of the valley can speak to each other because that's not the case. There's a strong social and political divide what happens uh, upstream and what happens downstream, they don't really communicate with each other. So through these journeys uh, that we've been undertaking in the last uh, two to three years, what we are trying to do is also establish connections and exchanges between the different parts of the valley. And that has been quite good and successful. And people go, oh, I didn't know that, you know, the flood also happened in this small town in Jewsbury, which has a majority migrant communities living there. And so, you know, there's a, there's a number of different divides that we are trying to break through with the project. How the organization and the projects are funded? So we are uh, an MPO, which uh, is national portfolio organization. So we receive structural funds from the Arts Council every four years. 
we have to apply to get funding from the Arts Council. But that only covers like the structural funds, yeah. like my salary and another person's salary and the rent. And we, we go to trusts and foundations um, for all the programs and all the projects that we do. So the Test Sites one was funded by Welcome Trust, which is a foundation uh, with a mission um, connected to health and well-being. Are there any other questions? So if not, I think that we should wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much for this presentation. From Luke part, I can tell you that I hope that this will be the start of a larger conversation. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, the next talk will be up in 15 minutes. And thank you, Anna, for Thanks coming. For the invitation. Thank you.